Thank you, Heather. So it is my privilege this morning to introduce our speakers, uh, Dr. Stephen Post and Dr. Matthew Lee, two prominent scholars in the area of love. So Dr. Stephen Post is the president of the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love, which he co-founded with Sir John in 2001. Stephen is a professor of fam family population and preventative medicine at Stony Brook University School of Medicine in New York. And he's the founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook. So Stephen is also a member of the Templeton Philanthropies, and he served on JTF's Board of Trustees from 2008 through 2014. Dr. Matthew Lee is a professor of the Social Sciences and Humanities at the Institute for Studies of Religion at Baylor University. And he's the director of the Flourishing Network at Harvard University's uh, Human Flourishing Program. And he serves as the vice president for the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. So both Stephen and Matt have led or co-led a variety of different JTF projects. So Stephen led the first uh, JTF project to the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love uh, in 2001. And in 2008, Stephen and Matt, they co-led a project on deepening our understanding of the experience and expression of godly love in the Pentecostal tradition. And Matt is currently leading a JTF project alongside Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard, at Harvard, focused on the assessment of interpersonal love. So together, Stephen and Matt have advanced our understanding on love and unlimited love. And I'm excited to have them here today to share some of their experiences and insights. So for the format for this morning, uh, Stephen's gonna talk first, followed by Matt, and then we'll have a time of Q&A. So join me in welcoming them here to JTF this morning. Hi, everybody. Uh, it is such a delight and a privilege to be here uh, at the John Templeton Foundation. It, uh, has a big part in my life journey, and so I couldn't be happier. And I especially am grateful to have Matt Lee uh, with us here because Matt's whole trajectory in life and love has been unbelievably spectacular, my humble opinion. Uh, I want to uh, also thank Heather very much for inviting me here. Thank you, Heather. And uh, what I'd like to do is keep my remarks brief because I'm more into community dialogue with everybody here. You're probably wondering, what is this unlimited love business, right? How many, raise your hands, be honest. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, a funny story, when I got to Stony Brook, which was 14 years ago, there was a young cub reporter for the local newspaper, and she had gotten online and she'd seen that I'd done a lot of media events around unlimited love. And so, the first night I was there, I walked into a pizzeria, and there in the foyer was this newspaper called the Three Village Herald. And the only headline on the front page was, Unlimited Love Comes to Stony Brook. <laughs> oh my God. And then the next day I walked into work, and there was a fellow, Eastern European, he looked a little bit like Mr. Clean, brawny arms, and he looked down at me as I was going up this huge escalator, and he said, are you Dr. Post? And I said, yes, sir, can I help you? And he said, are you going to save us? <laughs> so anyway, I lived that down. But I'll tell you, the, the, the greatest thing in, in, in life is love. And Sir John certainly felt that. So I want to just go for about five minutes and talk a little bit about um, the spirit of Sir John as I, as I, as I knew him. Um, he... Um, he sent me a fax in 2001, in the summer, and it said we should start an institute to study the greatest expression in human reality, and that's love. And uh, I faxed back, Sir John, that sounds great. Uh, what should we call it? He said, the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. You'll see that's his, his book there, Pure Unlimited Love. And I have to confess, I had a little bit of a moment of trepidation because I was actually studying a lot of Alzheimer's genetics and counseling at the time, and I wondered what my colleagues would think of this. 
So I faxed back Sir John, maybe we should call it the Institute for Creative Altruism, which is a more sciencey term. And he faxed back, no, I think un <laughs> un unlimited love up to uh, $8.9 million. There was a match involved, of course, which we made. So uh, I faxed back to Sir John, I love that language. It jumps right <laughs> off the page. And I think you'd have all done the same thing. And it worked out because, you know, he was so right. He wanted a true engagement with the great spiritual traditions. And it's love that makes the world go round. So uh, he would write wonderful things. Uh, he would write, those who are philosophically inclined may find it helpful to understand God's unlimited love as the original and ongoing basic creative force of the universe. This love was present from the beginning and it continues to hold all things together. Our fleeting human emotions and perceptions are in fact mere glimpses of God's perfect love. Which is to say, and this is something that Jack Templeton emphasized with me, we're not necessarily talking about human emotion. We're talking about something much bigger, much more metaphysical. Um, just an example of, of, of how we, we conversed. Uh, Sir John, I met Sir John actually about 1991 at a golf club where David Larson was having one of his uh, health and uh, um, medicine uh, 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 programs. He had the National Institute for Healthcare Research, and he was really a great pioneer of the area of religion and health. And uh, so uh, Sir John was sitting in the in the foyer, and and uh, David said. Why don't you go over and say hello to Sir John? That's him in that green jacket. And I went over and I talked with him. And we started immediately talking about love. And he told me this story about how when he was a youngster and he'd gotten out of college, he'd taken a trip to Israel. And he was with friends. And somehow or another, um, the, the state of Israel had not yet been founded, but they were under some imperilment. Uh, there were some nasty people around. And, and he had to leave, I suppose. And and, and, and he was worried about himself quite deeply. And his mother at that time, in, when, back in Tennessee, um, uh, had a premonition that uh, Sir John had died. And so, as Jack told it, uh, she threw away all his letters. She had a box of his letters and threw them away. And Jack would always say, imagine we had those letters. <laughs> and, uh, and so then I told him, I had a story when I was I, just 17, I was at Reed College. And I almost got killed on a motorcycle on the Pacific Coast Highway. And it was a long story, but I won't go into it. But as I walked into my dormitory, Ackerman dormitory, I never picked up the payphone. They had payphones there then, back, you know, payphones, OK. <laughs> and uh, it, I just felt, I, I didn't see anything, but I felt pushed to pick it up. I never picked it up. It, now it's 2 in the morning uh, in New York. It's, it's 11 at night in uh, Oregon. I picked up this phone. And I said, hello, and it was my mother. She said, Stevie, thank God you're alive. And I realized at that point that there's something about mind that is a mystery uh, that maybe isn't just derived from matter and tissue and cells, but it has something very universal about it. And I think, you know, Sir John and I, we said, you know, uh, you, he said, my, my mother uh, uh, had that experience 3,000 miles away, Oregon to New York. And his mother had that experience 6,000 miles away. So that was a bigger experience than mine. <laughs> but we talked about these things, and, and we wondered about it um, a great deal. So um, I'll just say that, that I was a natural uh, to connect with Sir John on the theme of pure, unlimited love. Uh, uh, you know, this really involves uh, a whole lot of uh, thinking about the nature of ultimate reality. Um, I'll give you an example of someone who experienced this, someone you have heard of from your literary classes. This is the great poet, W.H. Auden, who wrote uh, the book on the age of anxiety. He was hanging around Oxford a lot, and uh, he, had, he was sort of a guru to an awful lot of Oxford students. And here is his... Uh, experience of this invasive love. Notice the metaphor, invasive. One fine night in June 1933, I was sitting on a lawn after dinner with three colleagues, two women and one man. We liked each other well enough, but were certainly not intimate friends, 
nor had any one of us a sexual interest in another. Incidentally, we had not drunk any alcohol. We were talking casually about everyday matters when quite suddenly and unexpectedly, something happened. I felt myself invaded by a power which, though I consented to it, was irresistible and certainly not mine. For the first time in my life, I knew exactly, because thanks to the power I was doing it, what it means to love one's neighbor as oneself. I was also certain, though the conversation continued to be perfectly ordinary, that my three colleagues were having the same experience. And in the case of one of them, I confirmed this later. My personal feelings toward them were unchanged. They were still colleagues, not intimate friends. But I felt their existence as themselves to be of infinite value, and I rejoiced in it. That says a lot. I don't know how many of you have had similar experiences. <laughs> Raise your hands if you're willing. But uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful thing. And so um, we founded the institute, recognizing that we weren't just interested in human love, although we were interested in that. We funded great projects on how to raise kind children with Tom Lacona and others. And, and Fetzer Institute uh, uh, was collaborated with us, uh, uh, and, and we got that off the ground. We got a lot of things off the ground. Um, but let me just say that the, the great uh, meeting that we first had was um, in 2001 at a hotel in University Circle of Cleveland, where Margaret Paloma was one of our research area consultants. We had about 10 of them. I call them for short. It's not derogatory. Racks. Um, but we had Byron Johnson, we had Jeff Levin, we had Margaret Paloma, who introduced us to Matt Lee, um, Mike McCullough, Tom Ward, who's became one of the top theologians of love in worldwide by a number of estimations, Esther Sternberg, uh, Susan Wentz. It was fantastic. Greg Frischone was there. He went on to become the head of the Benson Henry Mind Body Institute at Mass General uh, uh, Hospital. And the list really goes on. And and. That's really what I was interested in doing, was cultivating people who I felt had this quality of deep love and who were spiritually oriented. And I thought they were the kinds of people that Sir John would want long term to carry this work forward. We had a great board, all old school Clevelanders, great philanthropists, Richard T. Watson, Harvard graduate, Harvard Law graduate, co-owner with Gordon Gund, of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He actually drafted LeBron James. Um, and so Dick loved this stuff. He was a mathematician at heart, and he was all into the cosmology of game theory and the nature of ultimate reality. And so uh, Dick went on, and he endowed for $4.5 million the Richard T. Watson Chair of Science and Religion at Harvard Divinity School. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, before that um, event, uh, the, inst the installment of the first uh, uh, shareholder. And so his wife, Judy, and his two sons and I all went to Harvard Divinity School, and we gave nice talks, and it was a great event. And I think that Dick would have been very happy. Um, the Institute, as I was counting it recently, we've, we've published 1,500 articles. Many of them have been cited many, many times. You might not, oh yeah, I, I should mention this, the Inamori Center for Excellence at Case Western. I had been to Kyoto and met Inamori because Inamori knew Sir John. In fact, Sir John had invested in Kyocera, and Inamori was a Buddhist priest and also a physicist. So I went to Kyoto and uh, for one of the Kyoto award ceremonies, and we got talking. And then about a half a year later, Inamori uh, funded for $12 million the Inamori Center for Excellence at Case Western. So that was a nice thing. So we got a Harvard chair. We got an Inamori center. And um, then maybe the, the most exciting thing, I'm going to wind up in just a few minutes. Um, how do we define love? So I get my definition. It's not original. It's not too much that's original with me. Um, I get my definition from Harry Stack Sullivan, who was the greatest uh, psychiatrist uh, healing people with schizophrenia in American history. Maria, you know Harry Stock Sullivan. Uh, the, the, you've, you've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind. So that's based on, on Sullivan's theory of schizophrenia as an interpersonal or social or relational problem that can be healed by love. He went to medical school. He had a schizophrenic break. 
Uh, this is Harry Stack Sullivan. He went back home to a small town in, in uh, upstate New York. And he spent a few years there. He was familiar with his environment, the, with the cows, with the, with the architecture, with the voices. And he came back into himself. And he came back to medical school. And he knew that if you can reattach to the reality around you, you can, you can get better. And that's exactly what uh, uh, with John Nash uh, uh, experienced when he went back to Princeton after that crazy episode up at uh, MIT with all of the the symbols and the, and the CIA business going on. But he came back, and, the, and it's when he's in the Firestone Library and he's writing uh, algorithms on the window for students. And the nice, the nice case, this is really, this is pure Harry Stack Sullivan. They invited him to teach a course in mathematics. And he's standing out in front of his door, class is over. Some guy comes up to him and said, I'm from the Nobel Prize Committee. I would like to have lunch with you. And, and um, John, John uh, Nash looks at this young lady who's walking out of his classroom, and he asks her, may I ask you something? Is this man real? <laughs> do you remember that scene? Some of you do, right? And, and she says, you know, giggling, yes, Dr. Nash. And that's the story. But, but the point is that, that, that this works out. And so one of my closest friends in Cleveland, um, Clara Rankin, uh, she's a billionaire. She's a Christian scientist. She's 110 now. Um, her son had gone to Princeton, and he had had a schizophrenic episode. She talks about this, so I can talk about it. And we started talking about uh, Harry Stack Sullivan and how to help people with severe mental illness. And she founded Hopewell. If you go online, you can see hopewell.cc. It's now actually under hopewellcommunity.org. She bought a 300-acre Amish farm. And had all these individuals with bipolar, with schizophrenia, living there for six-month periods. It was all supported well, beautifully staffed, a lot of volunteers. And, um, and we started using positive psychology to heal mental illness. And so at Hopewell, again, hopewell.cc, uh, it was the first therapeutic farm community to use positive psychology. So small groups where people with these difficulties and they were still medicated. Someone would come in from the Cleveland Clinic about every two weeks and give them their um, needed medications, but at a much lower dose that was less harmful with fewer side effects. Uh, but they would have small groups of five or six, no more than that, uh, with a small group facilitator. And they would have two weeks on kindness. They would be keeping a kindness journal. They would be doing acts of kindness. They, would, they, they had a little store on the corner of, was it 306 and whatever, you know? And uh, the, the old Amish men and women would be there helping them. And they would, they would make an effort to be kind to everybody who walked across the threshold. And now we've studied this with epidemiologists from Case Western, and these people really do get, do get better. And after a six month period, you'd have, you'd have groups looking at uh, forgiveness, groups looking at uh, gratitude, and people would be switching through all of these categories of positive psychology. And when they graduated, uh, they, they would go into, a, into an, uh, an inner city or suburban venue of Hopewell. And it's still going strong. And they're now, okay, here you go. There are 90 Hopewell-like institutions around the country now. And there's a national organization. And it's the hottest thing in psychiatry. So this goes back to a guy named uh, Harry Stack Sullivan who thought that love could heal. To me, it's just breathtaking to think about that. And, and you know, that's one of the things Sir John always said. He said, love heals. And he really believed it. So the big questions that we, um, that we deal with, how do we tend to uh, glow when we give? I call it glivin, uh, give and glow. Uh, how do kindness and empathy heal? How can parents and families raise kind kids and concern for all humanity? You've met Tom, Tom Lacuna, how to raise kind kids. I mean, that began at one of our first meetings. We funded that stuff, and it's now international. It's all over the world. How can young people find and follow their callings? Joanne Triner, listen to this. Why are so many people forsaking jobs that feel too small for their spirits? Perhaps we have been trying to squeeze our feet into the steel-toed shoes of our industrial age ancestors 
whose primitive ways of working have long been outgrown. The quest begins by setting aside the economics only mindset that has dominated our thinking and less, left us with a soul deficit. The widespread disinterest in work speaks for itself, having fueled the great resignation, the great slowdown, the great reshuffle. So this is why we're really interested in the notion of calling as love, being blurring the line between work and play in the name of love. Other things, how does our awareness of one mind within us all, Sir John liked that expression from the great physicist, there is only one mind, and therefore a mind really is a gift. Um, how does that bring inner peace and expanded benevolence? That's what our book in part on uh, godly love was about, that in fact, people who had this experience, and there were a lot of them, um, also self-reported an increase in empathic love. I'm going to wind up here in just a second. Okay. How does cherishing nature as a sacred gift benefit us? How can the major religions of the world abide in mutual tolerance, freedom, uh, and love for all humanity without exception? So those are the things that, that really uh, move the Institute over the years. And then on a, on a more uh, personal basis, okay, three more minutes. Uh, I per, I, I've always had great interest in love for people who are deeply forgetful. And um, so uh, during that whole period from really 1995, I was working with this wonderful neurologist, uh, Joe Foley, Case Western. And I was traveling all over the country with grants and doing workshops on uh, really attitudes toward deeply forgetful people. I gave up on the word dementia because I thought it was a lot like the word structurally, retard. Dementia is a decline from a former mental state and invites every kind of negative metaphor, husk, shell, gone. And you hear it clinically. And I spent a lot of my time clinically in these kinds of settings. So um, I wrote this book with Johns Hopkins, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, How Caregivers Can Meet the Challenges of Alzheimer's Disease. and. Um, it's got a lot of things in it. I have a couple of copies here if anybody wants one. But um, it does have a chapter. Is grandma still there? The mystery of continuing self-identity. Okay. And, uh, and that means that I'm not willing to say that uh, because the brain is atrophied, somehow um, self-identity is gone. I think that's a very arrogant attitude. Uh, so love for the deeply forgetful means acknowledging their continuity of self-identity. They may grow opaque, but we owe it to them to be faithful to their narrative. And so I was very happy when the Dalai Lama wrote me, and he said he was pleased to see the themes of consciousness and interconnectedness in this new book. Um, one of my old friends from high school, one of my closest friends, Charlie Scribner, whose dad owned Scribner's public publishers, he said, as a son who experienced up close the pain yet precious course of Alzheimer's over two decades, I wish I had the benefit of Dr. Post's work at hand in this most enlightening study of the mystery of human dignity and identity under siege. He lifts the veil on that dreaded disease and provides insights and hopes for retaining the connections that count. Those unexpected, seemingly miraculous glimmers of the beloved as through a glass darkly are here illuminated both scientifically and spiritually as we confront our ultimate humanity and human potential face to face. So that's Charlie. Charlie's really one of the great ones. Um, so finally, uh, just to end here uh, on a scientific note. So I was doing a radio program on the Institute for a program called Coast to Coast. Has anyone heard of Coast to Coast? It's Michael Nuri's show. It's the biggest late night, midnight radio show in America. It goes East Coast time from midnight to 4 a.m. And um, um, uh, they had asked me to, to do a whole program on this idea of deeply forgetful people because they were really impressed by it. And of course, a lot of the people listening to this, they have like 12 million listeners on any given evening. Uh, a lot of them are truck drivers on Route 80 being a Route 80 guy. But I will tell you that um, 
that night, uh, somebody was listening because a woman in California who is as of yet unidentified called through her lawyer and her investor, Stony Brook Development, and she um, contributed um, $300,000 plus, she's even talking about millions now, to do more study on paradoxical lucidity, on how it is the people who seem they've been long gone, chins down on their chest, they just seem absent, adios, but how is it that these moments of lucidity occur? And they're very well documented. So final 30 seconds here, uh, with the $100,000 of that money, uh, and it's an institute, but also a Stony Brook project, um, we are doing a Gallup poll. And we're asking people around the country, it's done very scientifically, uh, getting, whittling it down to caregivers, have you experienced in your loved one these moments of lucidity when they seem to come back into themselves? And was it prompted? Was it done through music? Was it, was it done through art? Was it done, did you sing for them? What, did, what, did, did it happen over a meal? How did this happen? Or was it just totally sporadic? And then we're asking them, so what does this mean to you? Did it, did it make you more loving? Did it make you shift from duty to love? That's one of the questions, from duty to love. And uh, this is almost, the, the questionnaire, it's 52 questions, it's almost done. And it's gonna be going out probably in the middle of March. But we're gonna be in the news, I guarantee you, because what we're gonna find out is the prevalence but also the importance of these revealing events when people realize that, you know what? Grandma's still there. So that's my, my comment. Well, I'd like to, it's hard to follow Stephen, um, especially, you know, just sort of taking stock of the development of this work and some of the people who've led it and been involved. And Stephen's the great connector and opening so many doors. And so um, just start with gratitude uh, to Stephen for bringing me into this adventure, to the Templeton Foundation for supporting it for so many years um, and for hosting us today. Um, I'm hoping, you know, what can I say in in 20 minutes um, on this topic. Um, not, not nearly as much as I would like, but I invite further conversation. This is really just a conversation starter. Um, you know, a snapshot of JTF's research on love. This can only be uh, the briefest of, of snapshots. But I'd like to start out with an experience because I think at the end of the day, the best things in life are transcendent. They can't really be named or imprisoned in language. The second best are mythical. We try to point to um, eternal truths through language. And then the third best are empirical. We try to operationalize um, these transcendent encounters so that we can predict uh, what causes them and what their consequences are. So that's, um, it's worthwhile, but it's not the ultimate. So I, I'm, a re, I'm an empirical researcher, but I think there's more to life than just what we're doing with our, our studies. And so I wanted to invite us, um, inspired by this moment, how many of you have seen A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, this fictionalized account of the life of Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, children's television show host, uh, played by Tom Hanks here, and in this scene, there's a moment where this journalist is just sort of venting very cynically about everything that's wrong with his life and the world. And, and uh, Mr. Rogers says, stops him and says, would you take along with me one minute to think of all the people who have loved you into being? One minute and I'll watch the time. So I'd like to invite us to do this. Um, if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes, not necessary, but it's helpful to block out distractions. Just take in um, a gentle breath in, let it out to kind of get grounded for a moment, and then call to mind maybe just one person who has helped you become your best self. 
who invested in you, who loved you more fully into being. And maybe think about one thing that person did, something specific that they did to help you grow. And just take a moment to notice how you feel reflecting on what they've done for you. Maybe there's gratitude there. And as we bring our minute to close, maybe stop to think that if this person knew you had taken a moment out of your busy day to reflect on what they had done for you, that it might make them happy. And you could even convey that to them afterwards. All right, so that's a, that's a minute. So how do we flourish? Well, we flourish because people have loved us into being and shown us how we might love others into being. So it's pretty much that simple in, in my opinion. And so when we look at this image here, this um, part of Sao Paulo, Brazil, separated by a fence, two very different material communities. Um, you know, if we think about flourishing as involving um, individual, organizational, community, communal, planetary, and spiritual dimensions of life-affirming forms of well-being in ways that promote well-doing, on which side of the fence might we expect to find more flourishing? And so I would say that that question requires some follow-up questions. Well, are we talking about material flourishing, which seems fairly obvious, having a private pool on your balcony um, <laughs> seems, seems like something there. But are we talking about social flourishing? Are we talking about spiritual flourishing? Then the picture empirically gets more complicated. And so then the follow-up question I would ask, or I would want to know as a researcher, and Stephen and I and Margaret and others have tried to study these kinds of things empirically, where are people most alienated from self, others, nature, and the sacred? And conversely, where do people feel fully alive and empowered to care for each other? So this is from, this is a quote that stuck with me when I read it back in 2015 in an article about why um, very well-supported students in a wonderful public school district were committing suicide. Um, and so this is Carolyn Walworth, representative to the Palo Alto School Board. This is Silicon Valley. Very, um, very good school, kids with bright futures. And her quote to the school board was, we are not teenagers, we are lifeless bodies in a system. So if you feel like a lifeless body in a system, it might not matter as much which side of the fence you live on. This is Akbar Cook a principal of a very um, uh, comparatively underfunded public school in New Jersey, who just released a book or recently released a book uh, titled Focus on the Love, a Transformative Approach to Organizational Leadership. And I think about Carolyn Walworth's expression in this picture from the Atlantic versus Akbar Cook's warm and generous smile. And I think we can see something about flourishing that goes beyond material circumstances. Some of you might know Lisa Miller's book, The Spiritual Child, that talks about very affluent kids feeling spiritually severed, lacking, among other things, an awareness of the deep presence of unconditional love in the world, despite material abundance. Well, Akbar Cook opened the doors of his school in the summertime, in the evenings, because kids in, uh, who attend the school were being murdered. And so he wanted to provide a safe space. Well, in the handbook for high school principals, there's not much about opening the doors in the summertime, uh, much less about installing washing, washing machines and dryers. But he didn't want to be a bystander. And so he said, we had to go at the kids a different way. We've led with love, being consistent and loved on them until they realized we weren't going anywhere. And he said, these are quotes, kids were, were, were not coming to school. Some were not showing up because they were wearing dirty clothes and getting bullied. 
well, it's not a laundromat. What can the school do? But today, Westside High School has five commercial grade washing machines and dryers to take away that cause of bullying. It doesn't take away all causes. But essentially, what I would say is that Akbar Cook, even though the school district had much less material support, experienced the joyful burden of loving, loving others into being under conditions of material scarcity. Carolyn Walworth experienced the unbearable burden of social and perhaps spiritual scarcity amidst material abundance. Their contrasting facial expressions hint at the importance of love in all types of material circumstances. And this helps us to understand why some of our own research at the Human Flourishing Program has found higher self-reported flourishing in materially precarious circumstances. So we'll explore this further in the Global Flourishing Study, of course, with generous support from the Templeton Foundation and others who have linked arms. The Harvard Gazette um, ran a story called Healthy Maybe, But Are You Flourishing? And I, they could have just as easily titled, titled it Love and the Promotion of Flourishing. And they interviewed me and Tyler for this story about, um, about the work of the Human Flourishing Program. And I said in that article, the difference between mere health and full flourishing is prioritizing deep, fulfilling, loving relationships. And this is aligned with research from the Harvard Study of Adult Development that's been going on for about eight decades now. George Valiant, one of the previous um, directors, famously said also in the Atlantic magazine, happiness equals love full stop. And more recently, um, and the Templeton Ideas website just published an interview with uh, Robert Waldinger, current study director, um, said the clearest message we get after, well, this was a couple years old, but he, he says the same thing in his book, which was just released after eight decades, is that good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. So because love is so important, we need more research to better understand it and then to help people love better. And so that's what's so exciting about my involvement with the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love and my collaborative work with support from the Templeton Foundation over the years is that we're trying to both understand love and be able to predict things from a research standpoint, but also help people love better and therefore live better and flourish. A lot of these studies investigate the partial constituents of love such as care or warmth. And Tyler, in one of his blogs a few years ago, to summarize some of the research that he and colleagues have done, and they, he said, we looked at the effects of different parenting styles on numerous health and well-being outcomes. Children who had parents with the authoritative approach to parenting, high warmth, high discipline, fared best later in life. But when parental warmth was considered on its own, it was the most important aspect of parenting we, we were able to identify. So even something as partial as warmth um, can predict a lot later in life. Templeton funding for research on love has been transformative. And I'll share just a few examples. I know we want plenty of time for questions. So um, I, I may, may not get through all of these slides, but this one I, I wanted to just offer a few examples. We could go on for hours. Um, First, as uh, Templeton, uh, as a recent uh, Templeton interview with Sarah Aljo argued, without love, we perish. Uh, Sarah founded the Templeton Supported Love Consortium, which is a great resource for, as the article puts it, providing a matchmaking system for researchers, a digital platform where they can search for and leverage existing data. This connective tissue is essential for moving the field forward. And that's where I see a lot of catalytic possibility and not just funding studies, but helping researchers make sense of collectively what's being produced and then how do we use it. Um, throughout human history, love has been one of the most, oh, I should say her study is titled, one of her own Templeton funded projects is titled, A Scientific Approach to Living in Love. And it shows that love involves life-saving human connections. Throughout human history, love has been one of the most important factors affecting both our mental and physical health. For example, one of Sarah's findings demonstrated that romantic partners who spend more time together have lower rates of peripheral inflammation, a precursor to deadly cardiovascular 
disease. So love is a matter of life and death. Um, there's the Love Consortium's logo. And second, Barbara Fredrickson, the inaugural recipient of the Templeton Prize in Positive Psychology, served as a principal investigator on a recent uh, Templeton World Charity Foundation uh, funded study uh, published just last year. The study explored the effects of an experimental intervention that involved watching a video of Barbara's TEDx talk on love, which demonstrated how to practice love in everyday life. And that's really important, not just studying for the sake of something theoretically interesting, but how to practice. Um, and it all, and this, the experiment offered reminders to people to do that, to practice it. Love in this study involved experiencing micro moments of positive connections that sync up heart rhythms and brain patterns as happens when we share a smile with other people. This study found that those who are exposed to the intervention and practice these micro moments of posit uh, positivity resonance outside their close circle of friends and families had increased pro-social activity, such as going out of their way to help others. This graphic, it might be kind of hard to see on the small screen, um, shows the various ways that Barbara's research has informed writing on leadership, among other topics, including a reference to her book, Love 2.0. So being more skillful at cultivating these micro moments of positivity enable people to be uh, more effectively loving and then healthier and better leaders and, and all the rest. I would say just something um, very brief about the book that Stephen and I wrote um, with our friend, Margaret Paloma, who, who sadly passed away last year. Um, and our national survey that we report in that book, again, funded by the Templeton Foundation, found that 81% of respondents in the United States, and this is a representative sample so we can generalize, acknowledge that they, exper quote, experience God's love as the greatest power in the universe. And similarly, 83% said that they feel God's love increasing their compassion for others. Those who felt God's love most frequent, frequently were much more likely to spend their time serving others to make greater donations to charitable causes and to strongly agree that all people share an unbreakable bond of humanity and that they wanted to make the world a better place. And now, um, with Templeton support, uh, Tyler and I and colleagues at Harvard uh, at the Human Flourishing Program are investigating the construct and assessment of interpersonal love. And we're grateful that uh, both Barbara and Sarah are among the pioneers in love research who serve on our interdisciplinary advisory board. Just a very brief overview of some of this research we're starting with some of our collaborators in mapping uh, keyword networks in the published scientific literature as a precursor to some theory mapping that we have planned. So the construct part is important. We're not just going to go out and ask people what they think love is. We're going to try to understand the construct and then assess it. Um, it, it's interesting that in this, again, it's probably way too small to see. Sorry about that. Uh, it's interesting that compassion altruism and compassionate love seem to be in their own cluster, this sort of violet cluster at the bottom, separate from the dominant cluster of love research keywords, which is in red. Um, does this mean that these aspects are marginal to love itself? And in that red cluster, we see keywords like power, violence, jealousy, and fear, or just to love scholarship. So is there something that the scholarship is connecting that, um, or failing to connect both that we might need to interrogate? Um, would a defendable normative foundation for the construct, construct of love include altruism and compassion, but not violence and jealousy? We, we seem to think there are reasons for that. Does a well-ordered science require normative foundations, in other words? And different disciplines use different labels for this, essential, normative, foundational. But the idea here is that all forms of love, regardless of the relationship type, romantic, parental, friendship, stranger, enemy, that all forms of love share a common set of essential features. And empirical research demonstrates this is, does seem to be the case, that investment in the well-being of the other for his or her own sake is an essential core across four kinds of love under investigation, romantic, parental, friendship, and altruistic. 
The dominant approach in social science, though, is more prototypical, sometimes called constructionist. In the humanities, they might call it anti-foundational, where there's an understanding of love based on some degree of resemblance across types in a context of fuzzy boundaries. So this is why people have been saying for decades that love is a weasel word. Well, I don't think it's a weasel word. I think we've misused it. <laughs> and turned it into a weasel word that is used more promiscuously than almost any other word in the English language. A group of a couple of social scientists in this book, The Dark Side of Close Relationships, claim that, quote, love and hate are indeed impossible to disentangle. Findings, therefore, across prototypical studies of both love and I would say flourishing well-being and other related constructs are mixed and difficult to reconcile because of this lack of conceptual clarity. In the absence of an agreed upon case definition, progress will remain limited. So if we started with a normative foundation, we can get this one from Tillich, that love is life itself in its actual unity, the structures in which life overcomes its self-destructive forces, then we would say, no, love and hate are not the same thing. They're, they're actually not impossible to disentangle. So the normative foundations set us off on a journey that might be different from what a lot of other approaches um, have taken. And I would say that one of the things we're trying to do to complement the work of Sarah and Barbara and others who f tend to focus on temporary states or micro moments of positivity is that we're looking at stable dispositions. Can I go further or should we stop? Okay, I'll wrap up. So, so if we want to um, start with a normative foundation and look at a stable disposition rather than a temporary state or a very uh, time-limited state, we might um, draw upon Aquinas and others and say that interpersonal love is the disposition towards desiring the good of the other. And then we can break that down into contribut contributory love, disposition towards desiring good for the other, and unitive love, disposition towards desiring the good that is the other. And then we can study these expressions of love as we're doing in our project across seven relationship types, parent, child, spouse, friend, God, neighbor, stranger, enemy. Is there an essence that we find across all these types? And I, I know time is limited, so I'll, I'll cut right to a couple of examples of questions for our survey that we've designed and we're now testing in the field. Uh, for unitive love for neighbors, and neighbors are in principle any human person, but especially someone whom one encounter, encounters or with whom one interacts, unitive love would be I deeply desire to be fully present with those I encounter. Contributory love would be I deeply desire the well-being of every person I encounter. This is a stable, we think this is a stable disposition that would persist over time. Um, in terms of, in terms of enemies, a unitive, an enemy is really someone who has settled ill will towards oneself or someone towards whom one is inclined to have settled ill will. A unitive love survey item might be, I truly desire to have friendly relationships with those who have ill will towards me. And a contributory love item would be, I seek the well-being of those I dislike because every person has incredible worth and dignity. And then preliminary findings from, um, a pre-post test at a small university in a required um, ethics class um, taught by a professor of theology of, uh, of uh, professor of theology and ethics finds that average scores among students in this class across all 13 neighbor love items increased from the beginning of the semester to the end. So there is it is possible to have an impact through our college courses, and then the correlations between love items and various pro-social outcomes also improved. And I just did crunch these numbers right before I got on the plane, so I, I didn't have much time to do anything elaborate. But really wanting to make sacrifices to listen to others is associated with um, the desire to have a positive influence on the world. And so the correlation at the pretest between these two items was fairly modest, 0.26, but it moves to moderate Again, other things going on in students' lives, but um, just a pre-post measure showed that the, the modest effect became more moderate, moderately strong, I would say. And then our single item is the desire to, to love all people. And again, the correlation pre to post went from modest to moderately strong. 
So I think that that's, um, that's an indication that um, we can have a meaningful impact and we can measure that impact and then we can learn from it and, and have an even more meaningful impact. I'll end with this. I know um, the time is, is a little bit short, so I'll, I'll skip my last slide. But, um, you know, I would say that going back to this idea that um, love, you know, loving each other into being is really the heart of flourishing. I would say that the best leaders know when to follow as when a hospital CEO for about four decades, which is pretty unheard of in that space. There's a lot of turnover, but but Bill was a, a CEO at a very large children's hospital for four decades when he allowed Angie and other miracle children to love him more fully into being. Um, you get important lessons for what it means to love and what it means to flourish. Angie um, sadly passed away from leukemia at this hospital age 13. And when it became apparent to her and her doctors and, and family that she wasn't going to get better, this was a great source of distress to those who were caring for her. And Angie took it upon herself to uh, make small art projects to cheer up the doctors and the nurses and the administrators like Bill. And one of the things that she made were sun catchers, which you hang them in the window and they sparkle. And um, she was working on a sun catcher for Bill when she passed away and it was unfinished. And he hung this in his office window for the rest of his career as a reminder of the unfinished work of leadership, which involves knowing when to listen and when to follow. So some of those questions I alluded to earlier, um, I think would help us understand why Bill was such a beloved leader at the hospital and in the community. And I would say that, you know, love is not, um, not fully quantifiable as these kinds of examples might suggest, but that even in tra tragic circumstances where there is love, there is flourishing. Thank you.